Hello and welcome to the first in our PCORI hosted webinar series, Confronting COVID-19, Finding Hospital Capacity and Improving Patient Flow. I'm Susan Denser, moderator for the session, and this is our inaugural one, Report from the Field, How We Are Managing Incident Command. In the coming days and weeks, we'll address other issues of critical importance to hospitals and health systems, and we'll attempt to bring you the latest and promising practices and evidence as these are evolving amid the pandemic. Before I introduce our speakers today and we get started, let me orient you to a few aspects of this webinar platform and to our process today. On the slide that you see in front of you now is a screenshot of the attendee interface. You should also be seeing something that looks exactly like this on your own computer desktop in the upper right hand corner. Right now, by default, you're listening through your computer speaker system but if you would prefer to listen over the phone instead, just select phone call in the audio pane and the dial in information will be displayed so you can call in separately on your phone. Now, please note that this webinar is being recorded to be posted on PCORI's website and the recording will be available to the public after this event. We will not be having a live Q&A session today. However, please do submit any questions that you have by typing them into the questions pane of the control panel. You can send in your questions at any time during today's discussion. We're going to compile all of those questions and then address as many as possible during the follow-up Q&A session this coming Thursday from 11.45 a.m. to 12.45 p.m. Eastern. Now I'm pleased to introduce the participants in today's discussion. As you all know, the epicenter of the COVID-19 pandemic in the US is New York State, with about 60% of the total confirmed cases in the country, and with the hardest hit areas being New York City and its surrounding suburbs, including Nassau, Suffolk, Westchester, and Northern New Jersey. So our two main presenters today are from this worst affected region of the country. Carol Gomes is Chief Executive Officer and Chief Operating Officer at Stony Brook University Hospital, which is the flagship hospital of the Stony Brook Medicine System on New York's Long Island. Mark Jarrett is Senior Vice President and Chief Quality Officer and Deputy Chief Medical Officer at Northwell Health, which is New York State's largest healthcare provider with 23 hospitals and more than 700 outpatient facilities. It's also the state's largest private employer. Joining me to pose questions to two of our presenters are two experts in their own right. They've got long experience with patient flow and hospital capacity issues. But of course, this current situation is unprecedented and it's just not clear how much if any prior lessons will apply. Don Goldman is Chief Scientific Officer Emeritus and Senior Fellow at the Institute for Healthcare Improvement, which is the independent non-for-profit organization that helps to lead improvement of healthcare throughout the world. Don has decades of experience in helping health systems and clinical teams improve the quality, the safety, and the value of care. He's also an emeritus physician in infectious diseases at Boston Children's Hospital and a professor at both the Harvard School of Public Health and Harvard Medical School. Eugene Litvak is president, CEO, and founder of the Institute for Healthcare Optimization, another nonprofit organization that catalyzes and spreads improvements in operations management and patient flow across the healthcare delivery system. He's also an adjunct professor in operations management in the Department of Health Policy and Management at the Harvard School of Public Health. So welcome to all of you. We're gonna to begin today with Carol Gomes and Mark Jarrett providing an overview of the situation their organizations now face with respect to COVID-19 and details of how they have structured and are managing overall incident command. Carol, let's get started with you. Thank you, Susan, for inviting me to participate on this prestigious panel. I truly appreciate the opportunity. Uh, some people may know that Stony Brook University is the home to the Allen Alda Center for Communicating Science. So when we started to pitch tents in our university parking lot to perform COVID testing, and subsequently to relocate our forward triage space from a makeshift outpatient clinic to yet another set of tents in the parking lot, I couldn't help but wonder if I'd see Allen Alda's Hawkeye character peering out of the tent in this mesh-like scene. It truly has been that bizarre of an experience. And 
honestly, it's been an extraordinary few weeks. We continue to expect the unexpected. We see things that we could have never imagined in healthcare at our prestigious institutions as we watch droves of patients coming through our doors with coughs, fevers, shortness of breath, with what feels like no end in sight. Many of you know, uh, as directed by the governor of New York State, that all hospital CEOs in New York State were asked to create a surge capacity plan to increase patient beds, at first by an additional 50%, but subsequently the ask was for a surge in 100% increased capacity. Our plans include expanding inpatient footprints into our ambulatory surgery center space, our endoscopy space, our holding area spaces, and several of our outpatient clinic spaces that are adjacent to the hospital, notwithstanding additional tents in the parking lot. We've been thrown into um, a few field tents for good measure. And today, uh, as we stand, we have well over 140 positive patients in the hospital, COVID positive patients. We have nearly 200 PUIs, persons under investigation, and the number of patients continue to escalate in terms of ICU care and intubations. In fact, over the last 24 hours, we've seen a, a significant increase in escalation with respect to intubations, patients coming in through the emergency department and uh, immediately requiring intubation. So we've been heavily focused on the tracking of ventilator use, anesthesia machines, ICU bed utilization. Um, it's been a full force of, of keeping track of all of these statistics. We have statisticians in-house who actively calculate our curve, and we continue to increase uh, in our number of positive cases and increase the rate of patients being intubated and placed in ICU care. The governor about a week ago had indicated that we were 14 to 21 days away from the apex, and based upon our calculations, at least internally, and that was about a week ago, it seems that this is on target and we're we're calculating around seven to 12 days away from the apex as mortality in our institution continues to climb. We opened our hospital incident command center about, about a month ago, and it's led by our chief medical officer, and it meets twice, at least twice daily, and follows the usual HICS structure with updates and reports that are provided regularly. And we do increase frequency depending on the circumstances, and we address that on a day-to-day -day basis. We receive at that Hicks reporting meeting updates on supply chain activities, physician, nursing, support, and ancillary staffing, updates on the progress of our surge capacity plan, which is in lockstep with our clinical chairs, and updates of various situational activities through our external environment, which includes communications with our local and state legislators, hospital associations, and other external entities, as well as media updates and communication forums. There is a very strong communication arm as it is extremely important to communicate as much information as possible to our staff, to our community. And this includes statistics that we accumulate throughout the day. Uh, we provide updates on our search plan progress and we coordinate staffing plans and any other new information about personal protective equipment or PPE with our team as well. We post daily informational segments on our intranet. I have conducted and written CEO blogs based upon COVID updates that we push out regularly. And we also push out daily communicate email communications to our staff and our faculty to provide an overview of the day and any new resources or changes in policy that may be applicable. So as far as key actions taken with respect to capacity, we have opened a number, a significant number of additional ICU beds as well as med surge space in non-traditional spaces. And as I mentioned before, we did work with the governor's office early on, about two or three weeks ago, along with Homeland Security and the Office of Emergency Management to create a drive-through COVID testing site in collaboration with our Department of Health. These tents are set up, uh, they have six lanes, 
there in our university parking lot and there's a New York State Department of Health phone number that the community can contact and they those patients are triaged and then they are scheduled if appropriate to have testing performed and they are assigned a date and time for testing for our drive through. In addition, we created early on a forward triage process, meaning that we were separating out our patients who were being triaged through the main emergency department uh, for those who were uh, less ill. And this really made a great difference in our capacity within our main ED. It allowed uh, the ability to press over to uh, another location some of that surge so that our main ED can handle uh, patients who were sicker, more acutely ill. As a matter of fact, this morning, I learned that there were about 200 patients who came in through our forward triage yesterday, which really saved the day for our main ED so that they would be able to manage their patient loads. So this forward triage process has made a great difference. And so initially we had it in our ambulatory area, but then uh, recently moved that operation adjacent to our university parking lot testing site. Uh, so this way it allows for more quick testing should patients require testing at that point in time. Uh, in addition, we created twice daily huddles separate from the incident command center to focus on incoming patient flow, not only with a focus on ED throughput, but a focus over the next following 24 to 48 hours based upon our surge plan. Uh, it's an interdisciplinary team of physicians, nurses, operational folks, um, our facilities team, working closely with our centralized throughput office. When we realized that the supply chain was drying up, including the difficulty of accessing various stockpiles, we started to become creative. The university's chemistry department began to make hand sanitizer. The IT team started to utilize 3D printers to create face shields and ventilator parts. And we began to use extension tubing for IV poles so that we can place them outside of patient rooms in order to reduce the use of precious PPE. And we started to retrofit vents to be utilized for more than one patient, though at this point in time, we have not utilized those yet, but we will be ready. Um, it's really the unthinkable, but when you're placed in a situation when there is no control over this supply availability, one has to take control of the situation in whatever way possible to strive for the best outcome possible under the circumstances. So we're embarking on a major effort to utilize a hydrogen peroxide gas approach to disinfect N95 masks that are used in aerosolized procedures. Um, and this truly will be a game changer for us in terms of um, the shortage associated with N95 masks. And in only three weeks, we were able to build an oxygen tank farm to increase our oxygen capacity. So what, is, what has changed since this pandemic arrived? We've canceled elective surgeries, which has created a labor pool of individuals whose roles have shifted, including those working in the ambulatory environment where clinic visits have significantly declined. Non-COVID patients are fearful to come to the emergency department and they are afraid to visit in a clinic for fear of being infected. So we're pooling those labor resources to take care of patients in the hospital. And the community has been coming out in droves. They're donating supplies and time and food, stitching groups coming together to sew masks and generous families are donating philanthropically to support the hospital. And hope on the horizon with the use of plasma phoresis and a variety of other research initiatives and clinical trials focused on COVID-19 patients um, and their treatment. So we are working diligently at Stony Brook to, to coordinate a lot of those efforts. So really in closing, I'm just, I'm proud of our Stony Brook medicine team. They come in every day with passion and determination to provide the best care possible with the tools that they have available to them. Everyone has been working tires, tirelessly as we race against the clock to build capacity and maintain our labor pool the best we can as the apex of this pandemic quickly approaches. And the pride of our team has shown through, through and through, and they have more than risen to the occasion. And it has really provided a sense of camaraderie, collegiality, and strong bonds as we're really all in this together. And we're doing everything possible to prepare for the worst while hoping for the best. 
And you know, just on another note, in terms of strategy, we have formed other teams that are focused on scouring the literature for best practices and resourcefulness and review of medical and clinical guidelines when we have, in addition, representation from pharmacy, our supply chain team, and respiratory therapy, all working together to identify the best clinical guidelines using the data that we have available to us. Uh, we've also formed a team that's focused specifically on vent use, anesthesia machine use, and BiPAP planning. That's led by our ICU physician leadership, our respiratory therapy team, and anesthesiology. And we have yet another team that's focused solely on ensuring the execution of the surge plan in a successful manner as we align it with the labor pool. And it all rolls up to the incident command center. So these are our experiences. And I look forward to turning it over to Mark to hear uh, his experience within his healthcare system. Thank you. Thank you so much, Carol, for that really extraordinary overview. And Mark? How did you look at Northwell? Thank you. So uh, as stated, uh, Northwell's a 23 hospital system that those of you know, the New York metropolitan area uh, ranges from up in Westchester all the way out uh, to almost the end of Long Island. Um, and we, be, before this, we had 800 active ambulatory sites, obviously, as stated by Carol, uh, so aptly many of them have closed and we've consolidated both to use staff as well as resources. Uh, but first of all, I, I have to commend uh, Carol and her team at Stony Brook. Uh, many of the things she described are things uh, that we've done at Northwell, and I'll try not to uh, repeat those, but instead uh, really give you a sense of some uh, lessons learned that we've had in doing this uh, so that you can think for the future, especially for those of you who are outside the New York uh, metro area or the tri-state area where you may not have been hit yet. Uh, so just to give you a concept of, because uh, uh, maybe you've seen uh, the governor's, uh, Governor Cuomo's uh, news conferences, give you a concept of how this has impacted us as a health system. Uh, we currently, uh, as of this morning, and I'm sure it's gone up, have over 2,300 positive COVID patients across our system. Uh, approximately 23% of those are on ventilators. And as Carol noted, uh, that they can walk into the ED looking fine and their O2 sat can drop and they can be intubated in two, three hours. Most don't, but they can be very, very unstable. Uh, the, you know, our ICUs have clearly outstripped our ICU uh, coverage. We've made uh, COVID positive units. Uh, we've off, uh, offset ICU care and really looking at staffing. Uh, staffing ratios have to change because we don't have enough ICU nurses. We don't have enough intensivists even bringing some of our anesthesiologists online and our surgical critical care people online, uh, we have not been able to uh, obviously cover all the extra sick patients, ill patients. So you need to think about developing staffing ratios, which allow buddy systems, where perhaps one critical care nurse is helped by two or three regular floor nurses. This becomes necessary as, as it goes up. And I will tell you, the ramp up was really quick over the last two weeks from, you know, maybe 10, 15 patients in our health system to the 2,300. Uh, it's really going fast. Uh, as Carol had said, um, we did form our EOC, our Emergency Operations Center, uh, about four weeks ago. We had a small group working before that, but then we expanded it. Uh, again, a lesson learned. Uh, we do many of the similar things, and it really pays to have a command structure because it really works well. It is the perfect thing to do. Uh, but we brought a lot of our leadership together in the very beginning and then recognized this was not the smartest thing to do because you had all the senior people in one room. No matter how big that room is, they, people can't be six feet apart. Uh, so subsequently, we really, after the first week, have moved this that all the meetings are remote. Everybody gets on, whether you use WebEx or Zoom or we use Microsoft Teams, but that is the way to do it. Uh, because you do not, you want people separated, especially in leadership, because these are the people who often have the knowledge base and the legacy base that can help. It's not that the other people aren't as smart, but they kind of know everything, especially when you're dealing with a, a large system. Uh, and teleworking has been actually a large thing that we've done through the health system. We've done it as preparation in the past because of snowstorms, uh, but now we really instituted it for uh, the staff, and it is amazing how many people don't have to actually come into the office to work. 
uh, and much of the work can be done remotely. Uh, one again, one little pearl I would suggest, if you're still waiting for the wave to hit you, if it hopefully never does, uh, start making sure you have enough laptops. Uh, start making sure you have the right security thing and teach your uh, uh, teleworkers how to handle it because remember you're dealing with PHI and HIPAA laws still apply. So this is a good time to do that. Um, you know, you also need to be looking as Carol said and have a good database. Uh, you need to make sure you know all the numbers you know, how many people are being discharged, how many mortalities. Uh, recognize that part of the problem is that even as it starts to slow down a little bit, uh, people on ventilators, where normally in an ICU, you might be the average length of stay for on a ventilator is four to five days. We're now talking two to four weeks. Uh, so it is very important to recognize that even as the numbers slow down, the numbers will still be surging past what you know what you might have thought about. Uh, staffing clearly, uh, as Carol said, bring people in from your ambulatory, bring, bring people in from other sites that are being closed down. But also think about those other sites as potential places to take care of patients. Uh, at one of our institutions, we are now moving our uh, postpartum patients actually over to an ambulatory surgery site on the same campus, but a different building, uh, because that will open up another unit that we can use now for our COVID patients. Uh, we are also using, uh, uh, we're renting space in, uh, in nursing homes uh, to use to decant patients, uh, so that patients who remain COVID positive, but are still medically stable in, in New York State, can't go back to a, uh, can't go back to a nursing home. Uh, as a place to get to cant them to so that you don't have a clogged hospital. Uh, you must, one of, the, one of the other things is you must con continuously communicate uh, with your staff. Uh, there's been a lot of issues around PPE and how many resources we have and people are uncomfortable. Clearly, everybody would love to wear PPE all the time. Recognize that most of the staff in the hospital, um, you know, often isn't fit tested. And you really can't be using an N95 respirator unless people have been fit tested. And you have to remember that when you fit test people, you have to throw away that N95. So think about your resources and how you do it. One thing I would give as advice on N95s is you can extend or the use or reuse them. Uh, there are you know, CDC guidelines for that. So it's another way of preserving them. Uh, we actually gave our staff little bags uh, that are breathable, that when they're not using their N95, they can put it in the bag so it stays safe, uh, stays clean, it's a breathable bag so it doesn't collect moisture. Uh, obviously, we replace it when there's ever a problem, uh, but you'd be surprised how much you can, you know, reuse uh, things that you never thought about. Uh, on other supplies, respirators, uh, you know, are obviously vents are a major problem. We never want to reach the point. Uh, that we keep, we don't have a vent for everybody, but again, like uh, Stony Brook, we've layered it. Uh, one little thing we've learned because we have so many patients in the ICU that you know vents are becoming difficult. Some places have repurposed their anesthesia machines uh, for using as ventilators. Although it works, one thing is you have to actually turn them off part of for a period of time during the day, ideally. Otherwise, the machines won't last. They're not designed to run 24/7 like a routine ventilator. Uh, number two, you often need an anesthesiologist to teach people or to help manage those ventilators, the anesthesia machines, because they're a little bit different than the average ventilator. So it is something as a backup, but I would hold it as a second backup as long as you have enough ventilators. Um, you need, you know, you need, you need also to look at your capacity issues. Think again about where you can put people that are not routine uh, routine care areas uh, because the surge is there. And finally, I would just point out at this point that it's important to remember patients come in with other conditions other than COVID. Uh, and that's really important. And that's also for your communications. We're all trying uh, as a Stony Brook and everybody in the New York area to keep people who have symptoms but are not that sick to stay home. Uh, because, you know, testing them is ideal, but, you know, we test them and it's positive, we're not going to do anything different. We've really kept our testing at this point, especially until our labs came up, uh, to hospitalize patients, to rule in or out, as well as to uh, staff that has, you know, that's been exposed and is a little bit sick. 
Uh, but one of you know one of the problems is that uh, if you advertise a lot about what you want patients to kind of stay away, uh, we've had instances where people have gone to urgent care centers who have crushing chest pain uh, and really have acute MIs and need to be in the hospital and probably would have gone to the hospital under normal cir circumstances, but they're afraid to go to the ED because they're afraid of catching COVID because there's so many patients there. So I think it's really important uh, that you, with your advertisements or your communications out to the public, that you alert them that if you have something that, you know, symptoms of a stroke, symptoms of a heart attack, come into the hospital. We will do the right thing and protect you because we don't want people with normal medical problems that are very serious dying because of, uh, because of this. The last point I'll bring out is although we've canceled elective surgeries, there's a difference between elective and emergency in the middle of urgent things. People who perhaps need cancer surgery, uh, people who, uh, you know, Need, need other surgeries, let's say, uh, as a second stage of cancer surgery or have had re re recurrent uh, gallbladder problems and are going to get septic if they have one more and are at risk and you really need to get their gallbladder out. What we have done is we've set up a central committee to kind of say which ones should be done and which ones shouldn't be done. Uh, surgeons, and my daughter's a surgeon, so I can say this, are pretty headstrong uh, and they think that, you know, they can do things. Uh, but you really need to control it because we've had a couple of circumstances where people went in for what we would have considered elective at the very beginning. And then the patients two days later came down with COVID and got very, very sick in the post-op area. So you got to be careful of that. At this point, I'm going to stop because I'm sure you'll have all great questions that will probably cover a lot of other areas. And I hope this has been helpful. Very much so. And thank you, Mark. So let me start by asking and going back to a point that Carol made that the, the peak uh, is still ahead of you all, uh, maybe nine, 10 days from now. Uh, and of course, that mirrors other estimates that the peak resource use in the whole of the state will occur on or about April 9th. What are you going to do differently when things are even more uh, pronounced than they are now? Mark, you want to start with that and then we'll go back to Carol. Actually, and, and, and part of the, you know, the command structure is we are, we have surge plans that are like level one through level 10, so to speak, and for each hospital. And, you know, we're up around level six or seven, but we can hit 10. And that is the use of every alternate site possible. Um, both first, it was initially in the hospitals, but now we're starting to branch out of the hospitals. Uh, we are also working on predictive modeling, uh, much as Stony Brook to try and figure out based every day on what's happening, uh, where we're gonna be in by the end of the week. Um, we are hoping that even though it may not be the peak wall over New York State, that in certain areas we are starting to see it level off. As you know, Westchester uh, was actually the epicenter first in New York, uh, and that has started to level off. Right now for us in, in New York City, uh, Queens is the, the biggest hot spread, and we're hoping that that's going to can start leveling off soon. But what you have to do is plan for the worst. As Carol said, you have to think about where you're going to get beds and where you're going to get staff. Supplies are a problem, but we're hoping that between the state and the feds, they're going to help us with that. Uh, but really, the ones we have the most control over are staffing, and, and, and you just have to map out scenarios and say, if this happened, what would we do if it got worse? What would we do? And plan it now. Uh, but it's always hard, as you know, they say in the army, you know, your strategy works until the first bullet is fired. Uh, so, uh, you know, we really need, you know, we really need to try, though, and plan ahead as much as possible. And Carol, what about you? And in particular, on, on staffing, how are you planning for the worst? So um, very similar to uh, Mark's organization, you know, it's really about flexibility and adaptability. We have uh, emergency credentialing processes in place. So physicians who are not typically ICU physicians will have privileges to take care of patients' populations that they haven't taken care of before or haven't done taken care of, you know, in the recent time. Uh, we are focused on the use again of the command structure for our surge plans and similar to Northwell Health have this structured tiered approach 
and we're about at that same level of six and seven, but each day we reassess based upon current state and a review of ICU beds, vent availability and such. We have started to move outside of the organization in terms of our surge plan. We've basically done almost everything possible within the, the four walls of the hospital, um, focused on any space that we could put our hands on to create into a patient care space. And now we are going outside of those four walls. So we, we're in the same, in the same situation. We're also looking at long-term patients who are in-house and we've actually separated them out as well as hospice care because for the most part, those patients are non-COVID and don't require telemetry or monitoring. So we're fi finding non-traditional locations for those patients as well. And, and in terms of our labor force, besides uh, cred emergency credentialing, we have um, generated lists of individuals who've retired in the last five years from nursing or other allied health professions or physicians in the region. And we have sent notifications to them and we're obtaining lists of volunteers who are willing to come back and participate in our workforce. So um, these are all the creative things that we're doing, um, but most certainly uh, we see a, a heightened sense. Every day we think it's worse than we've ever seen before, but the next day seems to be even worse. So uh, we still are a few days away from that height and we are doing everything in our power and might to focus on concentrating on the resources we have. And again, as Mark said, and I had said previously, uh, planning for the worst and, and hoping for the best. Can I make one other comment? Because I know you mentioned uh, hospice, Carol, and I, I just want something else you have to remember and plan for. Uh, we've already, you know, have a number of staff members who are very ill, and uh, one that was that did work for us that uh, that that did not make it. And just, you know, Pete, you have to think about how you're going to support the staff through this. Get you not only your employee assistance program, but get your behavioral health team to really provide support. Uh, of course, people are going to be either losing friends, uh, colleagues, uh, and this is especially true for the frontline staff that's taking care of the COVID patients. They are living in the in their PPE, seeing both older people, but unfortunately, younger people really have terrible courses, and uh, you know, and they really need this support. It, it, they're going to burn out otherwise. It's not only the number of staff; it's how you de-stress them. And I think that is a critical thing uh, right from the beginning, but certainly once it ramps up uh, like it is in New York, uh, that's that's as important as the number of people you have on the floor. Mark, that, that is such a great point. And um, we, you know, prior to this COVID crisis, pre-COVID, we had formed what we call code lavender teams for instances in which uh, our staff members may have interacted with a situation, a patient or a colleague, and are, are going through some type of crisis and behavioral mental health crisis or what, whatever, um, however we want to term it. And so we've actually invoked uh, our Code Lavender team, our crisis management team, to assist in, in caring for our, our own team. And we also created uh, virtual meditation spaces and virtual telehealth spaces for our, our staff members, because you're so right about that. It's really important to support the staff. They are every day coming to work, trying to take care of patients in a really untenable situation. And then we have to remember that they're going home to their family members who might be immunocompromised. Who, they may be caring for elderly parents. They may have children with, uh, of other types of disease states. And so we have to remember to care for our staff. So thank you for, for bringing that up. I'm, I wanna ask one more question and then I'm gonna to go to our two experts, uh, Eugene and Don. But Carol, since you just mentioned uh, telehealth and telemedicine, how broadly are you using telehealth now throughout the system and in what ways? Uh, we know some institutions are actually uh, giving patients in rooms iPads so they can communicate with their caregivers just outside the room to minimize uh, infections. What 
what what what what are you doing with telemedicine and telehealth in this environment? We are using the telehealth platform for clinic visits. Um, it gives patients the opportunity to be able to interact with a healthcare provider without having to get in their car and potentially become infected waiting in a waiting room to see a physician. So, and it also helps to offload our system. So we are using them for clinic visits, for some emergency department visits, and we are also using iPads um, in a variety of ways with our patients. You know, don't forget, um, in addition to supporting our staff, we have patients uh, with no visitor policies, uh, or, you know, we're very restrictive in terms of visitor policies. Uh, you know, some exceptions might be uh, for our pediatric patient population or for um, a woman getting ready to give birth or uh, hospice palliative care. But um, we are doing everything we can to support patients using iPads to be able to communicate with their loved ones and uh, having them send messages to their family members. So uh, we're using technology to uh, a whole new level that we hadn't used four or five weeks ago. We, we certainly were in the throes of telehealth, but this is really imploded to a point where um, it's significantly increased the speed of our growth in terms of the use of technology. Uh, and Mark? Just, yeah, just one more comment on that is, uh, number one, make sure your IT team uh, starts looking at it now, certainly before you start getting very busy with these patients. Make sure your Wi-Fi capabilities in the or uh, the units that you're using are really there so that people can communicate and that you have enough bandwidth. You gotta plan for that now. Uh, you won't be able to do it once things start. And, and, and just, to, and I can't uh, emphasize enough what Carol just said, iPads for the patients are important. We've unfortunately had situations where people do re rapidly deteriorate, their family is not there, and they literally are saying goodbye to them on the iPad before they're intubated. That's how serious this is and why that as an ability, and if you don't have an iPad, then the staff has been using their phone and letting them FaceTime. Uh, but this is you know, kind of really to put it in perspective on a human level, how bad it can be. So let's go to Eugene now. Eugene, with you, given your long, long experience in patient flow issues, what, uh, what do you think? You, you, you've heard about a lot of the changes that were made, particularly Carol mentioned setting up the uh, outside triage unit, what what else do you think, it, does it sound to you like made a difference for these folks in terms of their patient flow? Yeah, thank you, Susan. And first of all, I would like to really deeply thank Carol and Mark for what you're doing. You and your colleagues are heroes, and I think you're doing miracles based on what I've heard today. Uh, one thing I would like to emphasize in terms of what you're doing, which I believe is extremely important for every, every hospital, is to homogenize the patient. The obvious thing is to homogenize them based on the infected, non-infected, that's an obvious thing. But what I've heard from Carol that uh, you're also uh, homogenizing patient based on their palliative care need, and maybe you can uh, assign staff accordingly de depending on the workload to alternate between the units. So I really appreciate that's a absolutely critical right way of moving forward. The question that I have is what are the two things? The one, the most important thing that you are happy you've done before approaching this disaster. And the second, what would you do differently uh, two months ago if you have your current knowledge? Carol, you want to start with that? Well, certainly um, the one thing that I wouldn't have changed was allowing the creativity and the innovation and the ingenuity to come forward. Many people had many different ideas and, you know, typical of any type of a brainstorming session, no idea should be a bad idea. And so we collated many of these ideas and basically vetted them through various groups to determine evidence-based literature, best practice, and working toward narrowing down. One example I would say, um, not so much focused on uh, throughput, but more on the use of PPE was the different ways that PPE could be disinfected, particularly N95s. And so 
there was a variety of options coming forward, whether it was the use of UV light, autoclaving, dry heat, hydrogen peroxide gas. And we decided to pursue all of the above until we knew that we had the best practice in place, just for fear that if any one idea that we selected didn't work, we would be behind the eight ball. So that would be something certainly that we would do again and continue to do. All ideas are good ideas. I think what we would change, um, hard to say, um, hindsight is always 2020. Uh, we started this process well over a month ago and did everything humanly possible, but you know, you don't realize uh, how awful it could get so quickly until it's actually happening. You hear it on the news, you see it in other countries, um, but it's really tremendously impactful. I think that, um, perhaps the social distancing and uh, the focus on doing whatever we could to prevent the disease from spreading quickly, I, the, the uh, in quotes, flatten the curve process, I think perhaps could have been handled differently, uh, perhaps in, a, in the community. So we're focusing on public service announcements and, and other ways that we can get the word out. Um, so I think that the, the public service announcements and the focus on social distancing can make an impact and will make an impact perhaps in other states. And Mark, how about you on those two questions? What you would have done differently and what you're most happy that uh, that you did do? Well, similarly, I, I think gathering ideas from everybody has been really critical. And for those of you who are in parts of the country uh, that have not been hit yet, uh, listening to these kind of WebExes and actually calling people, emailing people, and I'd be glad to respond to emails. People have questions. There are a number of listservs going on. There's one through IHI where you can read people's experiences. And then if you have specific questions, call somebody and ask uh, because of the fact that, you know, unfortunately, we're one of the main epicenters in the, in the country besides uh, California and Washington. Uh, but, you know, learn from our experience. Uh, that's number one. Uh, number two, in terms of the question, what we have done differently, uh, it, it's a little hard to tell in the fog of war. I mean, there are little things we think we should have picked up on earlier. I think the key is to learn from this now, even in this peak, uh, and do your after action reports, your hot washes, everything, keep excellent notes because of the fact that there's a good chance we'll have a second peak, peak in the fall before you know, late fall before uh, vaccines come out. And we should learn from that right now. The other thing I would say is one other thing is a lot of the frontline staff, especially intensivists, want to throw everything at the patients because they think that these patients are desperately ill, which they are. If you're intubated uh, and hit the arts uh, part, you probably have a 90% mortality rate, 85, 85 to 90% mortality rate, no matter what your age. So they're trying to do anything they can to save the patient, and that's quite you know understandable. But I think you need to get your arms around guidelines so that you can learn from what you're doing, even if it's not a clinical trial. You know, Observational studies are not great, uh, but unfortunately, if the numerator gets large enough and the denominator gets large enough, you will be able to learn something uh, from it. So I think that, you know, what is really critical is start preparing for the next wave while you're doing this so you can learn, learn what you should have done differently so you'll be, be prepared the next time. So I want to bring Don into the conversation now. Don, from what yeah. you've heard. Yeah, thank you. First of all, uh, you guys have been so comprehensive and transparent in what you've shared that you've uh, managed to uh, answer a lot of the questions I was going to ask. And, and uh, like Jean, Eugene, I really want to thank you for what you're doing under incredible uh, difficult circumstances. Uh, I, I would like to, if you don't mind, drill down a little bit into a couple of issues. First of all, around the workforce. Uh, and I think it's absolutely terrific that you've recognized the need <clears throat> to support uh, the mental health uh, of the workers and all the stress that they're undergoing. Uh, and I'm just wondering, you, you know, my organization, we paid a lot of attention to making 
um, these kinds of services available to the staff who have many problems uh, that uh, aren't related to this acute situation, but uh, issues of depression, stress, uh, substance issues, and so forth. Uh, but it's always hard to get them to take the time or even to trust the system to avail themselves of the support. So here we have a massive need where uh, everyone could use support. How practically in the midst of all that's going on with people uh, uh, so fatigued and, bur and, and burned out and short staffed, can you bring those uh, services to folks in a meaningful way? You want me to start? Yeah, go ahead, Mark. Sure. So, I mean, you know, coincidentally, many of us, and I'm sure it's the same at Stony Brook also, have been working on uh, burnout as an issue uh, for our staff uh, for the last year or two. Uh, so we've already built some bridges in that regard. Uh, part of it is amplifying that. And quite frankly, it, it, it's, it sounds simple, but it really works. It's getting leadership out there talking to people emphasizing this uh having people from you know employee assistance programs or wherever you have walk the floors a little bit and just talk to people uh and then say here's the number to call if you want to talk further because a lot of people will be embarrassed to bring this up while they're amongst their friends uh and colleagues but they may you know if they're feeling that stress they will call later on i think it's you know it clearly can't get in the way of the patient care, but it, it should be part of, of the daily routine that people are going up and checking. And then the final thing is, you know, you know, you are your brother or sister's keeper. If you see somebody stressed out, and we've tried to do this before this because of burnout issues, you should be calling somebody and saying, you know, uh, you know, Bob or or Jill is, you know, really looks a little depressed and is getting very short with everybody. And this is not their normal character. I'm a little concerned about them. Uh, and get them, you know, and, and and let people, it's not a matter of reporting people. It's maybe just letting people know that they should be, you know, you reach out to them proactively. You know, we hear that you're, you know, under the gun a little bit. And most people will actually thank you for doing that. They've been embarrassed or they feel that they're not strong enough and therefore they shouldn't show that they're weak. Uh, and you really need to sometimes proactively uh, approach them. So just to follow up quickly on that, Mark and Carol, both of you, um, we hear from other parts of the country, particularly Washington, where uh, people have said that the staff has really, medical staff have essentially been experiencing unprecedented levels of anxiety, just off the charts that people have never seen before. But it sounds like Mark, you're saying you're managing through that. And Carol, wondering if you also feel you're managing through that high level of anxiety also. Very much so. Mark really hit the nail on the head in terms of the importance for leadership and other managers to take the time to walk the units, talk to the team, support the team, let them know that there is help if they need it, and that we're all here to listen to them as well. I regularly send out CEO blogs that are internal communications. Again, we send daily HICS meeting uh, information with, and we always have a piece at the very bottom that focuses on employee resources and how to access them, whether it's virtual meditation or uh, the crisis management team or em uh, our employee assistance program. and I do believe, I mean, really unprecedented times. When in times of crisis, people do tend to come together, whether it was Sandy or the SARS virus or Ebola. But this is something so different. This is something on a very different plane. And the support that the team gives each other to me really makes me pause to think about how extraordinary these people are and how they are so committed and passionate, not only for their patients, but for their team members and each other. And I've been looking at the photos that we've been posting on social media, the teams with um, hashtag, we're in this together, or uh, demonstrating support of one another and support of our patients. It's beyond touching. And I think it's 
so moving that it's something that I probably will never be able to shake in terms of this feeling that I have right now for what type of pride I have in, in the team and, and how they've really risen to this occasion. It's just, as I said, it's unprecedented, it's extraordinary, it's unthinkable, but they're in it together and they are supporting each other. And I've seen more support within their own team for each other um, than I ever have before. I mean, it was always there before, there was, there was always that collegiality, but this is just an entirely different level. <laughs> Can I ask one more question, Susan? Is that all right? Oh, yes, a quick one, Eugene, then we'll go, or excuse me, Don, and then we'll go to Eugene. Okay. Uh, I, I wondered, uh, looking at the public facing side of this, you mentioned uh, how you are triaging people so that they don't uh, come in to the emergency or the hospital when it's not really necessary, or on the other hand, when it is necessary, you have a triage process for that. Um, it, it, is there is this um, uh, triaging manned by nurses with algorithms? How do you deal with all of the health literacy issues and the different language issues in a crisis where everybody's first inclination probably uh, is to say, um, I want to come in, especially people who are used to using the emergency department as their primary care? Well, I'm sorry. Go ahead, go ahead, Carol, and then we'll go to Mark. Sure, I was going to say at Stony Brook, we are using uh, the emergency department physicians and nursing staff from the emergency department and our EMS team to conduct the forward triaging in an alternative location as well. So they're staffed both by the emergency department. And so it, it's helpful as they do have those protocols built in. And Mark? Yeah, sure. Uh, so similarly, we do do that as well. Um, interestingly, the number of regular ED visits not related to COVID has dropped dramatically, uh, which is why we worry about people getting untreated for serious medical conditions because they're, uh, you know, afraid to come in. Uh, but I think one has to recognize this is the true definition of, you know, as described by Carol, of a ma of mass units. Uh, I think we have to sometimes recognize we can't do everything perfectly, such as the health literacy issues or language, uh, you know, translation. Um, we try our best to do it, uh, but recognize that it can't always meet the regulatory requirements. Uh, we have to do it in a way that clinically, you know, operationally makes sense and delivers the right clinical care. Uh, but you can't dot every I. I mean, one of the things we're looking at now in the inpatients is changing nurses' documentation, which all of us know is probably a little overbearing to begin with on a regulatory basis, uh, because when staff is stretched, they can't be spending their time filling in boxes that quite frankly look good from a regulatory viewpoint, but really don't reflect the care that goes on, especially with an EHR where you can check things off. If you check it off in the past, mm -hmm. you know, it really happened. Now, it, just having people waste their time sitting down checking things every off every 15 minutes or 20 minutes instead of taking care of these very sick patients make no sense. So I think you have to be a little bit bold. You have to address it with your legal and regulatory people, uh, but you have to look to see what really works. And you know, and I know, Don, you know from IHI, there's a lot of waste in the system. A lot of things we do because we've just done it that way for 30 years. This is the opportunity to say, well, now it doesn't make sense and we're not gonna do it and watch that it doesn't have unintended consequences, uh, but get some of the, the uh, regulatory waste out of the way and do things the right way in workflows, which I think hopefully will change things after this event. If we catalog this and pro prove it's just as safe, perhaps we can get our regulatory agencies uh, to say, well, that really makes sense and let's do it that way going forward. Love that idea, thank you. So Eugene? Mark, I'd like to just add, yeah. I just wanted to add one comment relating to um, language translation because we had some folks within the community who were calling out for interpreters. And, you know, as you alluded to, Mark, there are a lot of uh, requirements and regulatory um, rules in place to ensure that you have the appropriate medical translators in place. And so the other piece was we leveraged with our vendor that provides language translation 
and working on other technologies that will assist and support us because there is an increased need for language translation, especially in the tense where we didn't have that technology before, but we're working toward that. So very important, um, and you, we talk about those unintended consequences to make sure that you have the right resources at the right place at the right time. Uh, thank you, Carol. Uh, uh, probably the uh, waiving the HIPAA requirement for interpreters could uh, uh, address that, but let's leave it aside. My question is, how about radiology? You have to clean between infected and uninfected. How you decide how to split your radiological resources between these two groups? Carol, you want to take that? Or Mark? Uh, well, I can take it because in many of our hospitals, unfortunately, they've almost turned into COVID hospitals where perhaps up to 60 or 70 percent of the uh, patients are COVID positive or under investigation, which means that, quite frankly, uh, you know, we can split, split the radiology thing, uh, units into the patients, you know, the, into two groups uh, because of the fact that there's such a large number of COVID patients. Uh, we obviously do the cleaning in between. You have to give the proper PPE to the, uh, not only the technician, uh, because, you know, the, the people who are helping get the patient on the table, et cetera. Uh, so you really need to use your radiology group uh, in the appropriate way. And again, it's been another attempt to look to say, well, do we need a chest x-ray every day? Do we need this every day? Uh, it becomes when, when, when you get stretched like this, you begin to realize that, again, a lot of the things that we've always done just because that's the way we do it is not necessarily what is really even in the patient's best interest, but certainly not necessary. Uh, but you just have to have your environmental people come in to clean the room. Uh, you just have to develop operational plans. And what we did is just separate rooms. And these are the ones for COVID patients. And these are the ones for uh, under the investigation, but you don't want to put them in the COVID. But the cleaning of this virus is not that big a deal. And if the patient is masked, uh, if they can be masked, if they go down to radiology, generally they're stable enough to be masked, and not always, but sometimes are. And you can, uh, at that point, uh, you know, at that point, clean the rooms well in between. And again, try and lower the volume of what you're doing in radiology, because that makes it easier to operationalize. So, Carol and Mark, you have just given the audience some extraordinary uh, mm -hmm. advice and counsel here, all the way from managing patient flow by virtue of setting up the external triage units, Carol, outside the hospital, as you said, lowering the burden on the ED for patients who don't need to go there. Uh, Mark, you've given terrific advice about making sure your IT is up to the task of doing all the telehealth and making sure the staff has laptops, uh, et cetera. You've both talked about the importance of the support for the staff, employee assistance programs, uh, just making leadership visible as a, a source of support. You've talked about uh, the ability to clean and reuse some PPE, including the N95 masks, which clearly many, many institutions are going to have to consider. And Mark, you've just reminded us that we could use this opportunity for good, which is to take some of the waste out of the system and really focusing on what really matters. For all in all, it seems to me basically uh, telegraphed to everybody they have to expect the worst even as they hope for the best but there are lots of preparatory steps you can take to get ready for that so I'm closing in just about 30 seconds each Carol what else if you had to leave people with the most important thing they ought to think about as they face a surge of COVID patients what would that be I would say to stay laser focused on the task to stay laser focused on this, your surge plans, always identifying what the next step is, where you're going to place those patients and how you're going to staff the space and to continually support the team. And Mark? Uh, similar thoughts to Carol, I would emphasize a, a rule of emergency management, keep your, your, your staff safe. If your staff isn't safe, then you have nobody to take care of the patients. So although we always think of patients first, in this case, the staff has to be remembered and be protected. Well, I want to thank so sincerely Carol Gomes from Stony Brook University Hospital, Mark Jarrett from Northwell Health, 
And our panelists are discussants, Eugene Litvak from the Institute for Healthcare Optimization and Don Goldman from the Institute for Healthcare Improvement. This has been such an informative webinar and thanks to you all. We hope that those of you listening will join us again on Thursday as we take follow-up questions from all of you. Uh, please chat those into us now. We'll be meeting here again Thursday, April 2nd from 11.45 a.m. to 12.45 p.m. Eastern Time. Again, uh, more information about other webinars in our series, please go to that uh, URL you see at the bottom of this slide. We hope you'll join us for those sessions as well. Thanks very much, everybody, and have as good a day as you possibly can. Thank you again. Bye-bye.